Thank you for joining us today for this We Count Digging Deeper webinar on uh, AI and disability, a double-edged sword. I'm Vera Roberts with the Inclusive Design Research Center, and I'm pleased to welcome you. And I'd like to start with our land acknowledgement. OCAD University acknowledges the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat who are the original owners and custodians on the land of which we stand and create. And I'd also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. And, and uh, thank you, Vera. I think we're gonna, oh great, we have changed. <laughs> so um, we don't usually take a lot of time to introduce people. Um, but we point people to the bio on the website. But Wendy's official bio on the site doesn't do her justice. She was working in this field well before she joined W3C. I've known Wendy from her days as a master's student working on an accessible, accessible kiosk and heard about her relevant work well before that time. She's been preparing for her Wonder Woman status um, since she was very young and has gained a, a great many valuable insights on the way, which is why we chose her as our guest on her our, our one year anniversary of this webinar series. W welcome, Wendy. Oh, thank you, Yuta. I'm very excited to be here today. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, what we want to talk about is both the risks and the opportunities of AI. So as you probably read within Wendy's bio on the site, um, she had AI and disability is her world at the moment or her world with, with respect to her uh, position at Microsoft. And we, we want to cover both sides and also look at what is happening currently and what might happen in the future. Um, so I, I think we want to start with the positive side. Um, it's undeniable, as you'll probably agree, um, that there are um, that AI has enabled some amazing applications that are life changing if you have a disability. And um, Wendy, can you think of some that stick out for you? Um, some of the ways in which AI has allowed um, possibilities that weren't there before. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of my favorite examples is seeing AI. Um, it came out of a hackathon project, a group of engineers, including Saqib Sheikh at uh, Microsoft um, wanted to use custom vision and it's just been really cool. Like I remember last time I was at CSUN, which was, you know, the last time it was held before the pandemic. Um, we went out to eat uh, with, with some coworkers and colleagues and, you know, one of my friends was able to read the menu independently through seeing AI because just on his phone, he had the ability to do OCR. And so I think that's a really shining example of AI that's very, you know, it's well-developed. I think there's some really cool upcoming applications of it. Um, one of the areas I'm most passionate about is mental health. And there's such a need for support for people right now. I mean, that, before the pandemic, we knew, you know, one in five people had, was living with a mental health condition. And in some countries in the global South, you may only have one mental health professional for a hundred thousand people. So mm -hmm. these peer to peer networks are super important. And so being able to support each other, but you know, you now have folks who may not, who are not professionals who don't have the tools. And there's some really interesting work going on with how to coach people in some of these chats or your email support things like in talk life. So uh, an empathy checker, it's like a spell checker, but helps you provide more empathetic responses to somebody who is in need, but can also start to flag things for, hey, this is a situation that may need a professional. So I think there's some really cool ways where AI can help us make better decisions rather than necessarily doing things for us. And I think there's some really, there's some really exciting things I, I see coming. Yeah, I love the um, the thought about 
coaching in terms of mental health. Um, in the existing uh, apps, which are, there, there's this cluster of apps, right? Um, there seems to be a common thread. Um, we're translating something about which we have a lot of data um, into a common or standard mode of, of uh, presentation or language. And those have been extremely successful, um, translating things that are highly visual for someone that can't see that visual information or those objects um, looking at uh, or translating standard speech into text, etc. cetera. Um, but there, what happens with things like sign language, if you ask Cortana, um, Alexa or series about, or anyone, if um, you're asking Cortana, Siri, or Alexis about something that's unusual, or you live in it, you have an unusual scenario, uh, what happens uh, with that? <laughs> yeah, if, if they don't have the data, they, uh, they don't provide very good answers or guidance, do they? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's, that's been interesting to see as well, even with seeing AI, you know, um, when you look at typical data sets, those are often created using images that are used or captured by people with sight and the images that are that someone who is blind or low vision is going to create the photos are going to be very different, right? They're going to be off center or maybe blurry. Um, and yeah, I mean, yeah, so I think there's, there's, you got to have the data. Um, another thing I do think is really exciting though, to, you know, stay kind of on the positive side is the personalization, right? I think there's been some really great research that where you can kind of take some of the, the trends, but how does my personal experience and my data predict what I need. And, you know, I, I, another example, another grantee that I get real excited about is at the University of Washington. They're looking at route finding and, and you know, giving people routing information, pedestrians information. And the question isn't, is this route accessible? it becomes, is this route accessible to me based mm -hmm. on my criteria? And again, I think that's a really, there, there's some really cool things there, but yeah, you got to have the data to do either one of those. Right. Um, actually, you're taking me on a, on a different tangent that I was going to go because one of my concerns lately is that there seems to be somewhat of a collision between that personalization and the privacy protections. So mm -hmm. the differential privacy removes a lot of that um, personally relevant information that allows that personalization. How do you think that's going to play out? Um, I mean, obviously, people with disabilities are much more vulnerable to data abuse and misuse, but the privacy protections that have been emerging are um, ones that are removing the, the unique characteristics of the data that would make tools uh, such as the ones you're mentioning helpful. Yeah, that is a really tricky problem. I don't have a good answer for that. I think where I see the most interesting things happening are, it, well, it's some of the stuff you've been talking about, right? Some of these data co-ops um, like Answer ALS where you, people are offering their data for particular uses and by particular people and there's kind of some gatekeepers of that of that data i think that's been incredibly interesting um but yeah i mean i think you should talk more about data co-ops because i think that is you know more about that right well, <laughs> and data trusts yeah well that that is one area that that we've been looking at um a grassroots rethinking of how um, data is collected, how um, it is processed, because of course, it's the entire data pipeline that is an issue, not just um, how the data is collected, but, but by whom and for what purposes. Um, so there's, um, within the ethical AI movement, there's a lot of discussion about how data flows can get polluted um, and how uh, when there's missing data, 
their proxies are used and those proxies are based upon fairly stereotypical or not very relevant assumptions about what those gaps are or what will be useful within a, a particular decision that is being made. So we've been exploring uh, the creation of cooperative data trusts where the uh, people that the data is are about are the ones that govern and decide who they trust uh, with that data and what decisions are made with the data. Um, and I, I think we've talked about that quite a bit, and we're hoping to explore that even further. Um, but it, um, the the other thing about it, though, is that the current AI systems are very dependent upon big data sets, so um, they're they're not capable of making the types of decisions that they're making without there being a, a large data set. So we have to almost renovate the, the entire ecosystem to start with small data that is contextualized. Because the other thing that's happening with these data flows um, is that the, the context is removed and the data set is passed from one group to another by virtue of needing big data sets, no one um, manufacturer or developer or user of an AI systems or developer of an AI um, uh, machine learning engine for making decisions can gather all that data on their own. So what happens is the data is aggregated um, and it gets completely removed from the context within which it was gathered. So we almost have to start right from the start what is the context that this data is gathered within and um, who is this data set relevant to and who is missing. Uh, we, in a previous webinar, we, we talked with Julia Stevanovich, who um, is looking at also a label with the data to say a nutrition label. So um, the same way that we worry about where does our food come from and what is the the context of that food was it ethically gathered are, are all these additional things added to our food we're looking at um, adding to the data set some sort of label that says this is where it's relevant this is where it's not these are the gaps here and um, so I, I think that's um, a highly promising area to look at well, and especially um, if those start to include what is the diversity of this data set, because I think yeah. that's the other thing that we've been seeing as well. When we looked at data sets that were used to create mental health guidance, you know, a lot of that data was collected from uh, people at kind of Ivy League schools. Mm -hmm. So kind of a lot of white people, you know, <laughs> exactly. and it was not a very diverse data set. And so um, I, you know, and obviously, you know, people with disabilities are often not included. So yeah, I think those, those, those labels are going to be really key. I think, yeah. and I think policy around that's really important. Yeah. So this gets into something that you've been exploring um, quite a bit, uh, success in the standard, standard um, AI systems is dependent on that abundance of data. And one of the reasons uh, for breakdown of those systems or malfunctioning, whether it's Cortana or Siri or Alexa coming up with really strange responses or unable to come up with a response or um, the uh, seeing AI not identifying, say, um, what is there, say, in we've seen um, it malfunctioning in places like Kenya or whatever, where the scene is nothing like where it was trained. Um, you and others have spoken about the data desert related to disability. How do you, uh, what are some of the efforts that you're working on to quench that data, those data deserts? <laughs> well, I mean, some of it is personalization. Um, there's a project, so kind of going back to that image example, uh, there's a project called Orbit in the UK where folks are trying to just train applications like seeing AI to recognize objects in my environment. So what's important to me, right? And so that also 
hopefully helps with some of the privacy issues. I think that's something that has prevented some of those, uh, the training of some things is, you know, a common question is, you know, someone will hold up a gift card and say, how much is this for? Or, you know, here's my credit card or here's money, you know, <laughs> you know, there may be, and so you don't want to train, you don't want to create a data set of all these personal items. So can you create some personalized data sets of, of the items in my environment that I might be recognizing often. So I think that's that's one strategy. Another is to try to get some funding behind creation of some of these larger data sets and try to create some collaborations where we know we do need a large data set and it's for the good of all for us to collaborate. And so kind of going back to that sidewalk example, you know, supporting something like open sidewalks where anybody can contribute that data and let's keep it in an open spot so that everyone can use it and benefit from it as well. So we're kind of, when I look at the projects that I'm investing in the portfolios, I, we're looking at a lot of that. Um, and, you know, we just had the employment workshop and, you know, the, the thing that I find most frustrating is that there's actually quite a lot of data out there, but it is, there's so many reasons why it isn't really culminating into these larger data sets, whether it's privacy issues or it's kind of the secret sauce for a company and so they don't want to share. And so one of the conversations I have most with folks is what can you share? What can we create as, as a collaborative data set? Or what is the shared schema that we need? I mean, that's the other thing. Everybody's collecting data, but they're doing it differently. And so what are some of those, you know, we can't even translate some of it, even if, we, if people are willing. So mm -hmm. there's, I think I have more questions than answers right now on that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, that's a dilemma we've been trying to deal with as well. And the minute you standardize, you are excluding non-standard data, right? Um, the, the act of trying to find something that is rep replicatable or where you can do a, a crosswalk between things and um, make some assumptions about it actually removes the the data or the data types that are more unique and different. And early on, we thought that um, AI would allow greater diversification of types and categories and clusters. But in fact, it's also moving towards that reduction. Um, we as humans, are there have great difficulty with diversity and complexity. And so there is good reason to, or there, there's been rationale for reducing, um, especially if we're depending upon many, many people who may not be um, well, who may not be trained or familiar with uh, a particular app or um, uh, a function to come up with clear, simple, instructions about how to sort something or how to label something. Um, supposedly, the uh, AI was intended to um, to make some of the, or to assist with that because AI or machines can deal with uh, complexity a little bit better than a number of very different individuals. Uh, but um, even the AI systems that have emerged and have become popular are reducing more and more. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> it's that clustering, the categorization, et cetera, all move towards uh, reduction. Well, and the hardest part is, I mean, really all it's doing is finding patterns. And we have such a, <laughs> I don't think we've, humans have a really hard time of measuring what it is that we want to, or, or how we want to define success and then how we want to measure it. And it's creating those proxies that I think are creating some of the biggest problems, right? We, we can't, like in mental health, 
you can't measure an emotion, mm -hmm. right? I, 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 I can't even tell you exactly what my emotions are, right? I mean, humans, we're, we're very complex, right? And so we create these proxies. Uh, you, you look at someone's face, you look at someone's um, heartbeat, you know, that can give you some really good indicators, but it still is a proxy for exactly how someone is doing or how someone is feeling or, or, or even predicting. Uh, there's so many variables that go into some of that. So I, I, I think that's, that's one of the hardest pieces of it. And we're going to, that's why we're just perpetuating our biases. Right. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Um, so one of the things we seem to be as humans, very enamored of is this notion of winning best, um, a solution, a fix, both uh, a terminus to any activity and also this idea of a hierarchy where there is one winner and the rest are losers or less than the winner. Um, and in, in this co complex terrain, oh, that's um, first of all, very much biased against anyone that's different, anyone that deviates from that notion of what is the best, what is the winning thing. And of course, the, the best and winning thing is never someone that's in the minority um, it, in terms of all of the other characteristic. We like to uh, characterize winning best based upon some sort of common um, characteristic, but having more of it or uh, being faster at it, uh, amplifying or accelerating something that everybody has. Um, and that I, I think, so there are quite a number of our human characteristics that we need to change, not just the AI. And one of the things we frequently say in the We Count project, or one, one of the things we've observed is AI is basically automating, accelerating and amplifying um, the existing human characteristics or human habits that can be for the good because we we talk about the power tools of ai and the power tools of ai are uh, a way of making what we do as humans more efficient faster and more accurate um but uh, our uh, focus has been on how do we have ai um replicate what we already do as humans as humans unfortunately rather than how do we use the machine to do things that we can't do as humans and thereby augment what we do as humans it's we seem to be on this course of replacing human intelligence with machine intelligence which is questionable in and of itself but that amplifying accelerating and automating uh, human uh, behavior human skills uh, also goes for the biases and the discrimination, which gets us into the risk, the other side of the sword. I didn't want to go there that quickly, but it seems it's weird. hard not to. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, so the, but um, risks to people with disabilities go well beyond the apps that don't work well. I mean, there are, and so I'd love to, I mean, I'd love to talk about, and we have already touched upon the apps that don't work well and what we can do to make them work or to improve their performance. If you're at that outer edge that we showed in the human starburst, when, if you're not someone with a disability that is very similar to um, the data that someone was trained on or that the machine was trained on. Um, there are some even more life-changing risks associated with AI uh, for anyone that uh, for whatever reason has been discriminated against before or has been excluded before, but we are using AI to amplify, automate, and um, accelerate that uh, discrimination. And you and I talked about some, can you, um, what, what are the ones that you're most worried about at the moment? I, the ones I'm most worried about right now are uh, related to employment. Um, I mean, for one reason, 
you know, the employment rate for people with disabilities, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities has not changed in 30 years. And a lot of the automated tools right now are not being very helpful. I think there's an opportunity if they are done well, but I think unfortunately, when you look at some of the personality tests, you know, we were talking about proxies, yeah. personality tests are, you know, people with mental health conditions are often getting flagged out for those. Um, some of the, you know, eye tracking during interviews or whatever um, are going to be biased, maybe against people with autism, you know, and we, we've seen some of the, you know, algorithmic hiring practices be biased against a lot of people, <laughs> partly because hiring has been biased against people. And so it's just perpetuating some of those. Um, but it's also in our place for opportunity if we can get those models right, right? I think that's what's interesting is where you can see um, coaching on the side of the interviewer, right? So if someone is not making eye contact, you know, can you help coach someone in that situation uh, to kind of guide them on how to interact with someone with autism? So, yeah, I, I, it, it, well, and I, you know, I think what this really all boils down to is there has been so much stigma and bias against people with disabilities. And therefore, folks have not been at the table to design in any of the innovations and therefore to collect any of the data. And therefore, it's kind of like no matter what you look at, that bias is getting perpetuated. Mm -hmm. I think I'm most worried about employment because, I, you know, from what I've been reading and seeing, that automation is really picking up very quickly mm -hmm. there. Um, but, you know, it's also, there's an opportunity. I, I guess I'm an optimist. I'm a pessimistic yeah. optimist. <laughs> right. I, I think I would characterize myself that way as well. <laughs> um, and of course, employment gets into almost everything, whether, I mean, one of the issues we've been worried about is health and especially during the pandemic, things like triage, but the, the it's who is in the, uh, the health positions and what is their training and how have they been educated and what do they know about the risks to minorities that uh, even, I mean, employment touches almost everything, whether you're uh, someone in um, defense and um, you're not aware that uh, some of the, the systems that are, you're using to guide your actions will cause collateral damage or will cause false positives with who you identify as a threat. I mean, it, it um, employment sort of touches on so many different parts of, or so many different parts of our life. Um, so uh, much of what we've been talking about is a common pattern uh, that people with disabilities are minorities or outliers in a pop population data set, um, or they are stereotypically categorized um, in the systems where there's data about the needs or the how to respond to a particular request. Um, but one of the things I'm worried about as well is, um, and those are topics that AI ethics has been addressing for some time, and there are common uh, responses to that. Um, but my worry is that those responses actually don't address the, the issues that people with disabilities face. Um, and one of the things that I've been um, thinking about is whether full proportional representation, even if we dry all, I mean, not dry, <laughs> even if we take care of all of those and quench all those data deserts, and we have uh, full proportional representation in the data, um, and even if by some miracle we eliminate the human bias that finds its way into the algorithms and that the engineers creating the AI systems um, will introduce, um, especially in uh, systems that make really important decisions about our lives, is that going to address um, and will we actually have fair treatment of people with disabilities. Mm. Yeah, and my immediate answer is just like, well, no. <laughs> uh, 
That's a really, really hard question. Um, Cause I've never, I mean, I, I, it's, well, I have to take a step back and think about where we were 25 years ago. You, you, you talked about kind of, we have known each other for a very long time and it, it looking back on where we were 25, 26 years ago, you know, it, it was really hard to get people to talk about web accessibility, mm -hmm. right? I remember back then people asking me like, you know, does the alt attribute have something to do with the alt key on the keyboard, you know, or why would someone who's blind want to use a computer? And, you know, well, why do you want to use one? And I now look at how much more at least in North America, I know this is not true around the world, but at least in North America, we see so much more conversation. We see so many more jobs specific to accessibility, more chief accessibility officers. You know, there's a, there's a whole new industry. There's so many more people doing accessibility than back then. So I have hope, I have a lot of hope. However, the other comparison I often make is way back then we had flash mm -hmm. and you know, we, every time a new innovation, a new technology comes about, people with disabilities are never, well, it's weird. We're kind of at the forefront of the true innovation, but we're not at the forefront of the adoption and the wide expansion of it, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're at the front of it in terms of, you know, screen magnification was created for people with low vision in the 80s, but it didn't really pick up until the iPhone used pinch zoom, you know, in 2000s or whenever the iPhone came out. <laughs> um, so that tension is something I really would love to figure out, you know, how and, and I, the hope that I have right now is more and more people are talking about design justice and responsible AI and transdisciplinary teams and more, you know, despite the top million home pages having 98, still having 98% of them still having significant accessibility issues, things are changing mm -hmm. and more people are getting with disabilities are getting hired and at the table and helping to make decisions. But you know, we got to So, so anyway, there's change happening. So I have hope, but is it fast enough? Is it enough? Is it? How do we really help that beyond North America? And again, it's happening other places as well. We're our program, your program, you know, we we're are we are seeing some changes happening elsewhere as well. But so I don't know, again, more questions yeah. than answers, but I think when I look back, it helps me have some hope for the future, but it means that there's some really important work that has to happen right now to ensure that. Yeah, and my worry is that it's not deep enough. We don't admit just how mm. much we, how far we need to go in rethinking. And I like the fact that you brought up design justice because certainly we need to renovate or rethink our attitudes towards design but i think it goes even deeper than that i think it goes as deep as think at the more deeply thinking about what does democracy mean and mm. um, how do we how do we have rights as well as um, proportional representation and majority rules um, it also uh, just research what do we see as evidence and proof? And um, how do we make a decision? And how do we plan? Um, why are we planning in with this assumption that we can actually uh, predict what is going to happen in five years? That's unrealistic, but it's also not, um, uh, it doesn't work for the complex lives of people who are at the vulnerable edge. Um, so all of those also bias against any work on um, bringing about greater equity. 
And I agree, there's a lot of work going on, but we seem to be satisfied right now or as a populace, as the, um, I don't know, whatever we call sort of the general public view, uh, we seem to now be satisfied with a response to AI ethics that is only surface or that is very performative. Mm. Um, if we have these auditing, an industry that's emerging that uh, does ethics audits, but in fact, and then certifies companies, but in fact, it's not going deep enough to look at the 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 extent of the bias that's there. It's only um, looking at um, protected groups that where we have a clear definition of what, how, what they look like in data and then comparing um, the general treatment of everybody versus the, those um, bounded identity groups. And, and of course that include, um, it doesn't include people with disabilities. So, I'm worried that we're going to move on and say, okay, this is fixed. This problem is solved. We don't need to worry about AI ethics anymore. We have a, just like web accessibility, um, where there were a, a number of um, automated testing systems and certification. This is, this is accessible. And so you just needed to get your certification and that uh, gave you your pass, right? Um, where we seem to have the same pattern in AI ethics, where there are these industries that for a price will run a test, give you a certificate and say, okay, you're good to go. I don't know, is that cynical or um, do, you, do you see the same pattern? I do see the same pattern. And I think there's some other aspects of it that I wanna point out that I'm seeing happening again. Okay. I agree there are definitely performative accessibility and the audits and all of that. However, I, with the other comparison to make is that while WCAG did not go far enough, we all admit that now, it was a really good start, right? I do believe it got us heading in the right direction and it allowed policymakers to make policy around the world such that it it shifted things enough to mm -hmm. open up that door. I believe we're having the same conversations now around policy and ethical AI. Yeah. And I think there are, I think, and I, I'm hoping that that's kind of the same thing we'll see. So while there, we're, we're kind of in that loop right now, it, 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 I do see that us maturing more. And I, I gotta say, that's one thing I am very proud of at Microsoft is Brad Smith, our president. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, that is not performative. When he talks about policy needed for responsible AI and ethical AI and equitable AI, that's legit. And I think there are a lot of people who see the need for policy because a lot of data practices and a lot of data use is just out of whack right now. And because we live in a capitalist society, businesses will push that as far as they can until they get some regulation. And so that is an absolute important next step is to get those policies similar to what we had in the accessibility space. And what's exciting about that, this moment in time, talking about capitalism, is the thinking going around sustainability. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so when you talk yeah. about stakeholder capitalism, to me, that's design justice. And those two marrying, there's some very exciting conversations. There's also some really horrible conversations. I mean, I think that is part of the aspect of being in a capitalist society is that that's, you know, there's some really greedy people out there, but there's also some really good people out there. And so I think there's also some, there's some really good thinking happening. And so Again, that's where some of my hope comes from is, I guess in my bubble, at least, I'm seeing some more of that. So I hope maybe I can help spread that bubble. Yeah, <laughs> I think we're both, uh, yeah, we're, we are hopeful for the same bubble. 
Um, <laughs> and you're talking about industry pushback. And of course, there's also been this tech clash, uh, public tech clash against some of the, the more negative pieces here yeah. and um, in many ways AI has not fulfilled the earlier promises neither the the um, utopia or the dystopian <laughs> predictions about what AI would do and uh, we're starting to have a more realistic look at or the I, I think my sense is certainly in the media in um, the sort of pedestrian discussions about uh, AI, there people are starting to see the cracks and the shortcomings of AI. Um, the one of the things we've talked about is that if we were to rethink AI, and it was designed uh, disability first, so starting at those individuals that have the most compelling use cases for this technology, but also are most vulnerable to the the risks. Um, could that lead to more innovative AI that is better at addressing the shortcomings that everybody's not noticed, the inability of AI systems to deal with the unexpected, to, to, do, to detect the weak signals, to address the complexity that is our world? Um, so the, um, I'd love to hear your opinion about that. <laughs> Well, of course the world would be better if they started with people with disabilities. I mean, come on. I mean, we've seen that time and time again that how many innovations happen when you really design for, for yeah, for people with disabilities. And it's not just for, right? We wanted to, yeah, with we want to design with and by. I mean, yeah. that's that's really the opportunity. No more screen line or sign language gloves, please. <laughs> um, and I, I do, I think there's there's an abs there's so many opportunities to revolutionize the world. I mean, I think seeing AI is just, that's just scratching the surface of what's possible. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I, I really, I can imagine a world where AI isn't doing everything for us. I don't believe that's the point of it. And that's not the power of it. It's that it's helping us make better decisions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as someone who lives with a mental health condition, if all my data flowed into something and I could start making some predictions or get some knowledge, it could really help me on my journey. You know, it's taken me <laughs> uh, almost 50 years to figure out some of this stuff. And not that I don't want to do the hard work. But if I could get some of those signals, positive signals to balance out some of the negative signals that I have internally, you know, I think that could be amazing. And if that's going to help me, imagine what it does for a teenager, you know, imagine if I'd had some of those tools when I was younger, I think my journey would have been, you know, no regrets, no regrets, but you know, right. there's some things that I would have done a little bit differently. And we just, due to the history of how many things have been developed with and by people with disabilities that have changed the world, you gotta, you gotta think that that's exactly the case with AI. Mm -hmm. And a point I don't think I quite finished that I do want to complete is that combination, that comparison to Flash, right? When Flash came out, it was used everywhere. The marquee element, like web pages, used to be so ridiculous because it just was so exciting and new. And I think that's kind of how AI is right now. <laughs> it's just kind of like the magic, exciting new thing and people want to use it for everything. I think as we really see where it is most powerful, that should tone down similar to what happened with Flash when we see the really good uses of it. That's my hope anyway. And do you think that, I mean, we've talked about capitalism and design justice. Yeah. Do you think there is a weakening of that uh, lever or that uh, force in the decisions that people are making? I mean, has the pandemic or uh, is there a trajectory there as well where, um, where the decisions of the, I mean, the world, whatever, the, um, are moving in a direction where capitalism doesn't have that great a hold, where it isn't 
that profit uh, will be the, the lever that is used for every decision. Well, I think what is most interesting and what I've been reading, workers' rights always get a good surge after a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, part of the reason is because we've lost a lot of workers. Yeah. And so the workers that remain have more power to, to ask and demand for more rights. The other benefit, well, the other outcome from the pandemic with as many people working from home as we're able, obviously you're seeing, I, I love the, the stories about the great resignation, right? How many people uh, have been very impacted by the last year to take time for themselves. Mm -hmm. And then with the murder of George Floyd and social justice, all of these moments culminating and impacting the entire planet you know it's really a moment in time that does not come around very often and i think all of these forces open up the thinking and the opportunities in ways that haven't been there in my lifetime mm -hmm. and the conversations i'm he hearing and what i'm see seeing people do i do think this is going to stick I do think, and, and partly because some of these policy and ethical discussions happened before the pandemic and they were only amplified, the necessity for them was only amplified and, and including people with disabilities, right? I mean, I think there was quite a lot of understanding how messed up, at least in North America, the healthcare system is, or maybe just, I should say United States, you guys got better than us, um, how messed up the healthcare system is and how much it's failing people. So I, a lot came to light, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, and I hope we don't squander this moment. I, um, okay. There is this tension between realizing that none of us are safe until all of us are safe and the, the, the sort of Dar um, social Darwinism approach of let the weak go in order to save the, str the strong. Um, and I'm, I'm very much hoping that uh, social justice will be the, that it'll tilt towards that and that everybody will have the courage to act upon that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the other, one of the other big things that came out of this, at least for me, is, um, is trust, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's such a lack of trust for very good reason yeah. in many of these systems, not AI systems, healthcare systems, voting systems, and not because they were rigged, um, right? I think there's, and, and how important trust is for people to really engage in developing technology and the future and collaboration. And so, I mean, I think that is what is most broken right now is that there is this lack of trust in some of these new ideas or in some of these solutions. Or to me, that's what would cause a squandering is if we can't have enough trust in each other to move forward together in mass. And that's, that's kind of what I am most scared about and what makes me the most sad some days. Yeah, and I think tangled up in that is the polarization that's happened. Mm. Yeah. Um, and the, the one thing that I've been observing and that I'm worried about is um, when th that the loss of the ability to self critique. Um, mm. So if the in defending one side or the other um, and thinking that there is only this defensive posture and that you need to defend against the other side. Um, we we can't move forward, right? We are reducing what it is that we're defending, and by reducing it, um, it's losing its uh, viability, and it's also so defending democracy down to one person, one vote, defending um, decision making to evidence based decision making, which of course means quantified uh, evidence, um, looking at impact as only the 
uh, benefiting as the most number of people with a single uh, particular act as opposed and all of those um, defenses of things that we would think are good um, and that support social justice are actually hurting social justice in that they are um, hurting the individuals that are in the minority that are most vulnerable um, so it's I, I think we, we need to think long and hard about the the systems that we have um, yeah <laughs> this is a longer discussion and I'm gonna I'm um, getting uh, tweaked by uh, the team to say that we should go into the questions um, that are coming from our audience and we have quite a few of them so I'm going to turn it over to our moderators to hear about some of the questions from the participants. Wow, we have a lot of questions today. And uh, so I was just dropping a note into the chat for our participants to let them know that um, we also have a place on our events page uh, in WeCount and uh, they can put comments there and potentially continue the discussion on the WeCount website. Uh, so I'm going to be really tough and I'm going to limit people to one question. Some people have multiple questions. So those of you who have posted a question, I want you to think about your favorite question so that when I come to you, <laughs> you, can, you can potentially ask that one. Um, so let's just start at the beginning. And first of all, I'm just going to check in with uh, um, someone who's had his hand up for a long time just to see if he's interested in asking a question. Uh, and that was Alfred. Alfred, you have your hand up. I'm not sure if you have a question or not. And you'd need to unmute if you wanted to ask it. Give Alfred a second. Okay. Alfred, if you if you want, you can come back and put your hand up. Uh, and I'm just going to assume it was an accident. So John, I'm actually going to give you a go. I'm going to allow you to talk if you if if you would like, or um, I can uh, read one of your questions from. Hi, uh, can you hear me now? We sure can, John. And hi, hi John. it's John Rogerward. Hey, hey, hey John. And you too. Hey, so I've got a question for you. I've got a friend. His name is Chris Bijou. He's helping uh, U.S. police departments and government agencies with institutional racism by addressing it from an epidemiological framework, generally tracing origins, identifying incidents, and control mitigation. How would, you know, control slash mitigation, how would this framework, how could this framework be applied to disability? Well, it probably, I mean, unfortunately, when you look at the statistics, um, there is a, what did I hear recently? It's, it's called the couch to prison pipeline. A lot of, a lot of uh, students of color end up in prison. So I wonder how much of their population have, may have undiagnosed disabilities and not to say that there's more prevalence in people of color, but just due to systemic racism, people are often misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed or don't get the right help. Um, so that's my first kind of question. <laughs> um, but I don't know, Yuta, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, the, the difficulty with decision-making based upon epidemiology is that um, it, data such as race, sex, uh, et cetera, uh, gender is, it is quite obvious. And, but the, one of the things we frequently say is that the only common data point uh, with respect to people with disabilities is a, a difference from the average, sufficient difference such that systems don't work for you. So identification, um, is very difficult. Lots of people don't self-identify. So there isn't really a data point that you could point to epidemiologically. However, if you were to look at um, data regarding 
threat that's not determined by virtue of self-declared information, but just what comes with respect to pattern recognition and clusters. Um, people with disabilities are overrepresented in those negative uh, profiling of, uh, uh, so whether it's the students that are seen to be not uh, able to perform within an academic institution and therefore should not be offered a place, uh, individuals that are seen as a threat um, within security systems, because you have a disability, there's this cluster of things that set you apart. And even if you don't identify as having a disability, the fact that say you've had an epi um, episodic disability and therefore you have a unusual work pattern or asset pattern, or you do things very differently in a student proctoring system, which detects sheeting, you are going to come up on the negative side of any ep epidemiological um, decision-making system without actually having a particular label of a protected group. So um, yes, there are, I mean, the, the system works if it's something as simple as uh, here's a threshold of your skin color and anyone, um, or if here's the threshold of how you've identified yourself with respect to gender. Um, but it, it's very difficult um, to use epidemiological information to uh, push against uh, discrimination against people with disabilities. Thank you very much, both of you. I'm excited to talk with Chris about this and I'll be sharing this video with him. Thank you. Great. And now I just want to let everybody know that um, you will not be able to unmute until I invite you to do so. Many people want to ask a question and they're asking how to unmute. Uh, and and I'm, I'm afraid that in order to sort of allow us to be one person at a time, I'm going to unmute as, as I give turns for a question. And so the next person I'm going to allow to ask a question is Monica Tsang. Monica, you had a question about um, people with disabilities. Uh, having a voice in development. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I was wondering many times when corporations are involving people with disabilities, it's usually a piecemeal interaction. Um, in the past, I went to talk to Google, Google Brain. I talked to IBM. It's always been... Um, where they, they had a particular project, they involved a particular group of people, and then afterwards there was no feedback loop. I don't know whether it was kind of like a greenwashing um, thing going on, but it seems like, is there a way for people with disabilities to have a continuous conversation in this development so that this, this process can be upgraded every single cycle? It's a very good question. I think what, I, yeah, I'm not sure the best way to solve that. I think coalitions may be a good thing that exist outside of the corporations so that there's kind of this ongoing pressure. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a good read. I think what my, I guess I have my hope and then I don't know, I, I'm also curious to hear Yuda's perspective. My hope is that through design justice and inclusive hiring, yeah. um, we actually, inclusive hiring, I think is one of the biggest levers we have to get that continuous seat at the table so that anytime a corporation is innovating, you've got people on the team who are then bringing others out or, or bringing that perspective. Um, and then my other hope is that through co-design and transdisciplinary teams, there's more ways to bring in those external voices on an ongoing basis. I know we've been experimenting with that in some of our work at Microsoft, um, but yeah, I mean, the other hard part about it is you don't want, you want people's perspectives, but also you wanna honor their time and try to employ them where you can, right? I mean, I think that free labor is something that really we need to figure out in our 
in this stakeholder capitalism nirvana that we're going towards. I don't know, Yuta, how would you answer that? Yeah, I, I was, the, my immediate response was um, employment, hiring more uh, people uh, with lived experience of disability. Um, and, but then the, the next piece that is often missed, which makes that almost um, a setup for failure is we really need to change corporate culture. Um, the disability or um, even DEI, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is often this sort of siloed uh, effort within most corporations rather than being a horizontal thing that everybody thinks about and is everybody's responsibility. And then um, the, we need to treat understanding of or lived experience of disability as an area of expertise in uh, similar to all of the other ways we hire consultants mm -hmm. and uh, pay them for their expertise. Yep. This is a, a critical area that needs to be valued and needs to be remunerated. Um, so, it, and there's many other things that's, that need to change. I mean, frequently people are brought in or recruited um, and then the entire work system is not, uh, doesn't work for them. So, and even if there is an enthusiastic welcoming team um, that starts to, because of the other parts of the employment system, it becomes more difficult to sustain that. And frequently uh, the, the communications or the participation in many of the work activities uh, the, the help or the redesign of those wears out. And so people get disconnected or um, their, their performance is threatened by the many little daily things that happen within a work environment. So it's a, again, it's a very, very deep fundamental rethinking of what is work, how does work work uh, get performed What's the environment? How do we communicate, mm -hmm. et cetera? Uh, how do we keep a team collaboratively together? What uh, sets you up for promotion or demotion? Uh, all of those things need to be rethought. And the work and the work environment and work life, I think would be far better if we rethought it from a disability first perspective. It would be better for everybody. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. Margo, you have uh, several great questions. Are you able to choose one? And would you like to try unmuting to, to ask? If not, I'll ask for you. Um, Hi, Margo. I think we lost her. Oh, no. Uh, lost no. Her. <laughs> All right. And you know what? Uh, I'll just give her another moment. There she is. Yep. Hello? There we are. Oh. OK, thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, this is really interesting, and it's a field that I haven't really delved into too much, but um, I was interested just in the work I'm doing about um, your experience about AI on the dysarthric speech level. Um, I'm just wondering if you could speak to that, because I just know from sort of on the periphery of this project that um, it's hard to get large data sets with that, but I know from working with some of those populations that um, there's so much variability across the data, you know, a number of, yeah, across the daytime, across the different levels of tiredness. Like, yeah, their voice varies quite substantially. Um, and yeah, if that's helpful or how that's being used. Yeah, I think in that case, I'm very excited about um, projects like Project Euphonia, where people, again, can submit their voice um for some larger data sets but again that personalization like you said is key because there's such individual aspects of speech um so i think I, this is another one of those areas where i think there's going to need to be both you know expanding what the the kind of typical the, the recognizers can recognize the speech but then also being able to train it for individual accents and changes over time um, you know, for in some cases, people's speech really change as they age or as different things progress. So, 
Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> Margaret, you're probably familiar with something that I talk about where the um, work on AI when it was rules based uh, back in the in the 80s uh, worked far better than the um, the machine learning models that we currently use. The the issue I think with the current systems is even if we collect a lot of data about a personal um, means of or personal interpretation of dysarthric speech to whatever is meant, um, it is going to be overwhelmed by any data set that is used within the voice recognition system. So this is where that an alternative, I think, is we should pursue uh, something that is on device where we don't have a large data set that from the average or the typical um, utterances of something um, where um, it, it is small data um, isolated from the overwhelming majority. Uh, and so gathering that data and uh, re-looking at how the recognition happens, I think is, is the most um, optimal or the most, uh, has the greatest potential here. Yeah, because uh, if, if I'm allowed just a quick follow-up, I, I just, um, I guess it puts a lot of onus on the individual, like I'm thinking about in that specific example, uh, because we're doing some um, re-speaking training at Ryerson and, um, you know, I, I've had sort of a, a chance to try Dragon Naturally and things like that. And the, the effort to train your voice um, is so substantial, even for someone who's got a fairly average voice or a neurotypical voice um, or typical voice. But yeah, I'm, I just feel like it, do you see this um, as problematic for putting extra onus on people to develop their own systems who are out, fall outside the norm. Like I'm thinking of people in for this specific example, like with our, this artistic speech who. Yeah, so that they, it'll become even harder the further you are from the average. If what you're doing is training a standard um, speech recognition system, um, I mean, the, the same applies to in, in, um, instructional tutors. They say these, this is good for struggling students, but the further your learning approach is, or the way that you learn from the average or typical, the harder it, it is. And to move the entire model towards what you need. Um, so this is the, the myth of um, addressing the needs of someone that is currently excluded or that has great difficulty. The further you are from the, the average and meaning the more you're struggling um, with whether it's speech, uh, rec having speech recognized or whether it's learning something, the, the harder it will be. And the more there will be frustration, uh, mistakes and so it's how do you address with the mistakes how do you fix misrecognitions um, that is something that's often not attended to in these models or in these systems um, so I, I think the the only way to do it is to start bottom-up grassroots with the individual create your own data set um, and build that up and aggregate afterwards uh, if it's with respect to the the data that is different from the average. Of course, in a speech recognition system, you, you're using other things. So um, the uh, prediction, once you have recognized something, the disambiguation of um, how you generally make up sentences or sentences within English or whatever language you're speaking in, there's ways to use the, the general data set, but stripped of the the pieces that where you are very different from the norm. But this is a, I'd love to talk to you about the technical pieces of this, but that's probably getting into um, more weeds, technical weeds than we need to in this talk. Great. And now I'd like to invite Nat from Tokyo to ask a question. Hello, Yuta. Uh, this is uh, Nat Hosono from Tokyo. And it's 3 a.m. in the midnight. Oh my <laughs> gosh, uh, thank yeah. you for joining <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah, and actually from today, the Tokyo Olympic is going to start. 
uh, Olympic and Paralympic is going to start. And my question is, uh, say a recent uh, gadget, say iPhone or anything, to access the data is very much difficult. Many uh, passwords or many, what say, a pattern matching, such kind of things is necessary to log in. And for the elderly people or disabled people, it's very hard to do. So how would you think that the such kind of security matters versus easy to use? And uh, do you think that AI will help us for such kind of issues? Right. Um, so and the contra oh, sorry, you to say it's that yeah. contrast between easy to access the data versus the security, that challenge. Yeah. And um, I, I think here personalization again is some is something that has promise. Um, we've been working on, and, and Wendy has as well, um, this idea of a portable preference file that where you work out what it is you need or um, uh, want within getting digital access uh, from the in one place, and then that you carry with you um, and that would address the security issues as well and I, I, I yes I think there are a number of ways in which um, AI can help with that in helping you discover and explore uh, what it is that you need to, to gain access um, but I, I'll let Wendy answer as well. Yeah, I mean, I think there's the double-edged sword of biometrics, right? On one hand, it's, it, you know, the, the facial recognition that works for many people is a really, can be a very easy way to access things. But then, um, I don't know about you, but anytime I get a new pair of glasses, the facial recognition stops yeah. working. <laughs> so, uh, you know, needs some work there. But I think there's some, um, and making sure that you don't get locked in. So the preferences you were talking about, if I don't want to use my face, what can I use or what am I able to use? So, but I, you know, I know some of my friends in wheelchairs who don't have access, you know, who it, it's hard to access the phone. Some of that facial recognition makes it super easy to get into things. So preferences. And now, Allison, I'm going to let you have many questions. I'm going to let you choose one uh, to ask. Um, I'm, I'm allowing you. To, there you go. I think you're ready. We can't hear you, but I know you're not muted. Oh, so I, I don't know if you mean my name, Larissa. You mean? Oh, it says Allison Carroll. Okay, so. so but it's sorry. Larissa, is it? Yeah, it's Larissa. Yeah. Well, thank you, Larissa, for joining <laughs> us using Allison's ID. That's no problem. Could, oh, would you like to oh. ask a question? I you didn't have know some. that. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know that. No, no, it's this. perfectly fine. Your question, please, Larissa. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you guys for this high-level conversation here. Super necessary. Um, here in Brazil, um, um, talking about gathering da data that you're saying, here in Brazil, it's very hard to gather data from, from people with disability um, because uh, most of them, not all of them, but most of them, they are kind of afraid to, to give their voices or to claim about their rights or anything about services or products or whatever that does not attend them because they don't wanna be disliked. Um, and um, how, how can, so my question is how can we co-create with them um, uh, so that they give their voices because um, I think that they don't have to be waiting to be invited to dance. They, they have to show the world how they want to dance and they have to ask the corporations and everyone to join them, not the opposite, uh, not be waiting for that. So how can we change this game here um, from, from a, from a uh, grass up uh, perspective like you would have said? What I, I don't, I'm, well, I think my initial thing is, I mean, it goes back to what we were talking about in terms of trust. And it's hard when you say, you know, they should take the initiative to educate the corporations, because I think people have been trying. I know um, uh, a few years back, I had a conversations with one of my friends and he's like, 
I am done giving feedback to corporations because I give and I give and I get ignored and I get ignored and I give up. And so I think that there has to be hand stretched out from the corporations. But then I also think that when corporations aren't doing that, they need to be held accountable. Um, and so I think in that point, there's some pressure that grassroots can apply. Um, but yeah, that, that trust, you can't just, there's a lot of discrimination and stigma. And so it can be very hard for people to raise their hands and say, I have an issue um, because it can really uh, not be beneficial for you. So it, it's, it's a hard first step to take. I, I don't know. Yuda, how, how do you Yeah, I, I agree with you. There's a lot of consultation fatigue because um, people do this performative consulting somebody with a disability. And so they go to the same group all the time or the same groups, usually five groups. And um, they, they have this notion that if you ask these five people, it will rep represent everyone with these disabilities. And they often it's to verify a decision that's already made to sort of rubber stamp something that um, has uh, where they the critique isn't really wanted. Just we've decided this and is this a decision that you can support, um, which of course goes to your trust. Uh, am I really being asked to help with a decision or are you using me to whitewash something that to say, yes, I've uh, consulted somebody with a disability. Um, so it, it, it the, the, I think what needs to happen in general is uh, we need to learn to remove the stigma from being different, um, understand the value of difference. And I, I think that's tied into our uh, survival as a society. We are, we are creating all these monocultures, whether it's within the companies, within many of the decisions that we're making, we're moving towards I mean, social media, people like us, um, uh, the popularity echo chambers that we've developed in all of our discourse, whether it's news, whether it's what we view, et cetera. So, and of course, um, artificial intelligence amplifies all that. So, and that's dangerous, um, hugely dangerous for us as a society, as a world. So um, yeah, <laughs> um, you're, I, I'm tempted to drive almost every question towards this, this deeper thinking about where are we going? And I think the key is to uh, rethink the systems that discriminate against people with disabilities and start with individuals that are most vulnerable to the risks, but also have the most compelling uses of any innovation that we need to make. Yeah. And I, I see that Vera is there. And I think if I can just get one more point in to, Go echo ahead, it, Wendy. to, to build on what Udo was saying. I mean, I think, yes, we've been looking a lot about how do we help people in India, for example, with employment. And, you know, the folks there don't even often have consistent access to phones or laptops. And so a lot of what we were talking about today, they're definitely, their data is definitely not getting included in how do we help build systems. And so, when you talk about that point, Utah, that's who comes to mind. And if we can solve it there, imagine how that can help us everywhere else. So, right. Yes. Well, this is always the toughest part of our webinars for me when I have to tell people that not only is this really terrific discussion coming to an end, but also that we did not get to all of the great questions we had. And so I encourage people to visit the WeCount website post your questions there um, or reach out and we'll do our best to try to get some of those questions answered. So thank you, Wendy and Yuta for sharing your discussion with us. Um, really, really interesting. I could see a lot of people enjoying it uh, through comments in the chat. Um, but before we go, Yuta, I think we were, we were hoping you might also talk about challenges the way we think about them in We Count. Right, so um, we count unlike, uh, well, maybe like some projects, but uh, what we want to be um, 
guided by and what we would want to prioritize. And this, of course, makes it difficult when we have to give a, um, a prediction of exactly what we're going to do throughout the, the project timeline is we want to be guided by um, the, the challenges and um, the issues that are um, that the community as a whole um, and individuals with disabilities, with lived experience of disabilities are experiencing. And so that is where we are, we invite people to um, nominate challenges. Uh, and we have a group of individuals that are advising us uh, that also have uh, experience of disability that are um, helping to, to choose what we will work upon. And we work um, on those challenges uh, together with uh, co-designers who um, uh, guide our uh, prioritization, but also the design of the, the approaches that we're using. So I'm gonna turn it over to Fira to talk more about this. And I also want to remind everyone that uh, there's ways to share your learning and, and to participate in our um, events and challenges. Uh, we provide micro-credentials and you can keep an eye on our badges page on the WeCount website so that you can earn your learner badge for this webinar. And Vera, can we save the questions that are? Um, we're going to. We're doing our best to save those questions. Right, Actually, wonderful. we've we've had a back chat about that to try to make sure we can save them and post them. Um, but again, uh, people are invited to also post them on the events page on We Count, just as a as a backup. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us um, and invite you to visit We Count uh, and participate in more of our events and sign up for our newsletter so you can keep track of what we're up to. We like to have you participate in our in our project. Thank you.